Hey, Pin Dude here. Welcome back to My Vintage Pinball. Today's episode, I thought I would do a little overview of my Back to the Future pinball, uh, since it's the only pinball in my collection that I haven't really shown or covered on my channel. Uh, it's the only game that I've kept uh, from my last collection. I've actually owned this game for 12 years. Uh, did not do a full restore on this game. Uh, I call this game a survivor. It is mostly all original condition except for the play field, which I did restore. Uh, so in this video, we're going to do an overview of the game. I'll show you what I've done to the game, the condition that it currently is in. Uh, and then we will do a overview of the game rules and uh, stuff like that. And then finally, we will do a gameplay video. Uh, I will try to play the best I can. I am not a very good pinball player. Uh, mainly just like restoring the games, not much of a player at all. Uh, but this is a fairly popular game due to the theme. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of credit for its gameplay. And I'll show you why that is. And I will show you why I pretty much like the game. There's some things I don't like about the game. Uh, these Data East games seem to be you either love them or hate them. Um, I typically like Data East games. Uh, I look forward to getting more Data East games in my collection. I think I've owned two Data East games since I've been collecting. Yeah, I, I owned uh, this, this one, and I also had a Lethal Weapon 3. Uh, but this was actually the first pinball that I bought. I bought this in 2006, 12 years ago. The game was made in 1990, so the game's 28 years old, and I've owned it 12 years, so that's not too bad. Uh, so let me uh, reset up the camera and I'll show you my Back to the Future pinball machine. All right, so as I mentioned, this was my first pinball machine. Uh, prior to this, I had a uh, game room full of video coin-operated arcade games. I think I was doing the video arcade games for about uh, five years before this game. So about 2001, I got into coin-operated games. Uh, picked up this game because I'm a big Back to the Future fan. I don't have a lot of history with playing pinball as a child. Uh, I grew up playing uh, video arcade games and game consoles as an 80s child. Uh, but this is the game that got me into pinball. Uh, I pretty much sold all my uh, coin-operated video arcade games at this point and switched over to all pinball soon after getting this game. Uh, so this is Back to the Future of the Pinball. It was built in June of 1990 and it sold 3,000 units. Uh, on the line before this game was Robocop and on the line after this game was Fan of the, of the Opera. Uh, this game was designed by Ed Cibula and Joe Kamikow. The artwork was done by Paul Ferris and the music and sound was by Brian Schmidt. Uh, to compare the game sold on this, it was 3,000, uh, which was about normal for Data East. Uh, two games after this, Data East released The Simpsons Pinball, uh, and it was their highest uh, production game at that time. It was about 5,500 units. Uh, so this game is somewhat hard to find, uh, and it is uh, quite collectible due to the theme. So the cabinet is all original, and it uh, is in quite good shape for an original cabinet. Uh, if you're familiar with Data East games from this era, uh, they tend to get a lot of planking, a lot of vertical lines in the wood, and the paint just basically flakes off. Uh, you, you'll see Data East games from this vintage where there's just chunks of paint missing, and it's just worn right to the wood. Uh, so there is some planking in the cabinet, both on the front, especially right here, and a bunch on the sides, uh, but it's not too bad. Uh, when I got the game, it was just generally dirty, and I did a full buff with Nuvis 2, and then I, I keep it waxed to help protect it from the UV and to give it a nice even finish that resists uh, fingerprints. But overall, it's not too bad. Uh, I did repaint the coin door, uh, this new shooter rod, and some new parts in the coin door. Uh, inside of the coin door, I'm sure I cleaned real well. Uh, set up for CoinMax, 25 cents. Has a cash box, uh, needs a lid. But overall, cabinet-wise, uh, was very good condition. The lock bars on these and side rails are powder-coated, uh, kind of a textured black, and there is quite a bit of wear on the uh, edges of the lock bar and a little bit where the lock bar hits the side rails. Uh, so they could use to be reworked, but I'm keeping them original at the 
current moment. The uh, back glass is in really nice shape. Uh, it is an actual glass back glass, uh, unlike what Williams was doing at this point, which was mainly translates. Uh, it's a mirrored black glass, but I must say it, the colors are dull, not very vibrant. The mirror, the mirror effect is not as well done as some of the Williams games that you saw, like uh, Earthshaker and stuff like that. Uh, the artwork itself is Paul Ferris, and it's very good. One complaint is they did not get Michael J. Fox uh, to be able to use his likeness on the game, so that is... Somewhat looks like Michael J. Fox, but it's very easy to tell that that is not Michael J. Fox. Paul Ferris's signature is right here on the back glass. Uh, but it is a very nice glass. Uh, it's just not as vibrant as, like, the rest of the game is, especially the play field. Uh, it still has this original sticker on it, uh, featuring the hit songs Double Back by ZZ Top and The Power of Love Back in Time by Hugh Lewis and the News. Uh, so... There's a couple minor scratches on the back side of the glass, but that you cannot really see them at all uh, when the glass is lit up. So the play field on Back to the Future Machines is uh, originally a pretty full mylar. It's a mylar that pretty much covers the whole uh, main section of the play field. Uh, so the mylar on this game was very bad, bubbled badly over the inserts, uh, had a lot of ground and dirt under the lifted sections. Uh, so what I did is did a full mylar removal, uh, touched up the play field, and did a two-part on automotive clear coat on the play field, and it is as smooth as glass. Uh, there was really v only very minor wear uh, on the play field. These uh, Data East at this point was using um, a pretty good top coat. I don't believe it was the uh, hard coat yet. I believe it's still a lacquer play field, uh, but they're pretty durable. And if they were well taken care of, they don't get a ton of wear. So uh, the play field's really nice. Uh, let, let me get some close-ups of it, and we'll shut it off, too. Inside of the cabinet's quite clean for an original game. Uh, there's really uh, not much staining on the bottom. I actually did not sand the bottom of this game. Uh, this game was actually, uh, cabinet-wise, was never out in the workshop. Only the playfield was for the playfield restore. Uh, other than that, this cabinet's been in the game room for 12 years. Uh, so this is all original inside. Um, a lot of times on, uh, this is the uh, flipper board. A lot of times on Data East games, you'll actually see these uh, broken. Uh, the play field has a tendency that you can actually kind of drop it into the cabinet, and it takes out the flipper board here. Luckily, that's never happened on this game. Uh, underneath of the play field's quite nice. Uh, I did have everything off this play field, but I didn't have uh, tumblers and stuff like that back then. Uh, so it doesn't have the level of detail that I do to my games now. Uh, but everything was taken apart, cleaned, rebuilt new coil sleeves, all of that, um, and the game, you know, hasn't gotten a ton of play since then. I, I typically don't play all that much, uh, so it is really nice under here. All right, so let's go behind the back glass here. So back glass, pretty good condition. You can see the uh, lightning bolts are actually uh, clear. Uh, don't know why they went that way. I guess uh, the effect you get when the flasher goes off uh, through those clear lightning bolts. Uh, insert board is the original paint, just cleaned. Uh, incandescent bulbs, as always. I'm not an LED guy. Uh, as far as I know, the original displays, I never changed them. Uh, they still work just fine. And inside, if you're not familiar with the Data East system, it is basically a uh, copy of the Williams System 11 hardware. Uh, so much so that you can actually uh, use a Williams power supply, System 11 power supply in the game. Uh, 
So as you see in my game, uh, it has a Rotten Dog power supply. The one weak spot on the Data East hardware is the power supply. They tend to overheat themselves and burn out components and actually burn the traces. Uh, the traces lift up on the board. Uh, so the Rotten Dog power supply was in the game when I bought it. Uh, I still would like to get a original Data East power supply and rebuild it for the game. And that is on the plan uh, for pretty soon. This is the uh, Data East uh, CPU board. It's pretty much identical to like a Williams System 11C, whereas there's no sound hardware on the CPU board. The, all the sound hardware is on the soundboard, which is right here. And this is uh, what Data East calls the PPB board, uh, basically like a driver uh, power auxiliary uh, power board, like on System 11. Uh, so uh, the batteries were originally up here. Uh, this is basically a kind of turned version of the System 11 board. I have a remote uh, three AA battery holder up there, uh, but I don't really go that route anymore. I do the uh, CR2032 uh, lithium cells nowadays. So I think what we're going to do right now is pull this CPU board out and we're going to convert to the CR2032 battery. Uh, so within this video, we'll do a little how to put a, a lithium 2032 battery on your Data East uh, CPU board. And this will also apply to a Williams System 11 board. Uh, so let me get some tools and we'll get this board out of the game. All right, so we're gonna remove this CPU board to change the battery setup. Obviously, I have the game off. I even went as far as to unplug the game from the wall. Better to be safe than sorry when working on electronics. And I have my remote battery holder here on little uh, connectors. So I unplugged those and I just have to route the wire out of the clips here. And now we just disconnect it. All right, so I got the board out. Let's take it out to the pinball workshop and get to work. All right, we're out in the workshop. Uh, Tool-wise, really all you need is your normal soldering equipment, soldering iron, solder, uh, cutters, uh, some kind of desoldering tool. I'll be using uh, my solder to put it. And the first step is to remove whatever battery device you have on the board. If you have uh, an original battery holder, clip it off, and then unsolder your pins. In my case, I have the wires that are left from my remote, remote battery setup. So first I'm gonna cut this zip tie off, and then get to work on removing the solder, and we'll see what we have here. All right, so we're gonna take our soldering iron here and see if we can get the wires out first. out all right so on this data east board it's pretty easy uh, so to start I have a 2032 battery holder that has soldering pins on the back uh, I got this one from Big Daddy Enterprises a while ago when I was ordering other stuff from him. I bought a whole bunch of these. Uh, they're not very expensive, and you can get them other places too. And then, of course, you're going to need a uh, 2032 battery for this. So we got that standing by. Uh, so on the board, we removed the battery holder, or in my case, I removed this old wiring that I had. And there's uh, two pins here. Uh, the ones on the bottom, or depending on which way you have the board, uh, in the game it would be the bottom right pin. 
is labeled positive and if you take a continuity meter and check that pin to the blocking diode at D25 which is right here uh, the bands facing away from the battery uh, we have continuity there and then this middle tab here is labeled negative and you can see that the ground plane is hooked up to the rest of the ground plane here so if we take our continuity meter put it on ground there's our ground uh, all these other grounds are isolated they're not actually grounded so we don't for this board we don't need a jumper wire we're just going to take the positive end put it in the positive hole and the negative hole fits in the negative hole and it fits on the board there's no drilling necessary or anything so this will go real quick and if you look on the back side of the board here's the the uh, big trace that goes to the blocking diode so that's the positive the negative is isolated on this side of the board it is getting its ground through this grid pattern on the top side of the board here so all we have to do is put our positive in the positive hole and our negative in the negative hole and we'll flip the board over and we'll tack that in with some solder All right, so we got our battery holder in here. I'm just gonna take my continuity meter and make sure that all the connections are correct. So this upper tab is the positive. So this should have continuity with the blocking diode at, and it does. And this tab here is the negative and that should go to any ground point and it does. And let's make sure we don't have any connection between positive and negative. We don't, no continuity between negative and the blocking diode. So we are good to go. It, it was as simple as that. It literally took, uh, you know, 10 minutes to do this. So now let's put the battery in and check to make sure we're actually getting the uh, voltage to the chip. All right, so let's check our voltages here. I have my meter on uh, DC volts. And we're going to put our ground on the ground. And we'll just check at the battery. We have 3.25 volts. We're going to check on the non-banded side of the blocking diode. We have 3.25 volts. Now let's go to the banded side of the diode. We should have a slight voltage drop. We have 2.908. Uh, so now if we follow the trace, we get down to the chip. And we have 2.90. There's also on the Data East board, there's this little loop of wire. This is a test point, and it says B, plus, which is battery positive. And we have 2.9 volts. Nice, they give you that little battery test point there. All right, so that's all good. We can put our meter away. Uh, it, you know, it was that easy to get this all hooked up. So now uh, I want to make a little label uh, on the board here. I'm going to put a little label with the date on it. Uh, that will remind me of when I put this battery in. I like to do that on all my games uh, just so I have a way to tell when I change that battery. So uh, let me fire up the, uh, the uh, label program on my Dymo label maker here and we'll make a little label. All right, got my program for my label maker up. Today's date is uh, September 5th, so 9, 5, 18. Got my little label here. Let's trim this up. that on the board right next to the battery all 
And there we go. The board has uh, got the CR2032 battery on it. Got our little label for when we changed it. Uh, so let's go back to the game room and get this board reinstalled in the game. All right, so let's get our board mounted back in the machine here. All right, so I'm just gonna check to make sure all my connections are right, my ribbon cables are on correctly, my connectors are on, I'm not off a pin on anything. Everything looks good, so I think we're ready to button it up. Climb under the games here to plug it back in. All right, gonna flip the switch. Back to the future. And we got a memory area. And now, if we shut it off and turn it back on, back to the future. No more memory error and. Uh, that's just like on a Williams System 11, the first time you turn it back on after you had the batteries out or whatever, it says uh, adjustment failure. Uh, so on uh, Data East, they actually tell you uh, it's the battery. A lot of people on System 11s don't even, uh, you know, don't know that adjustment failure means a battery issue. Uh, so Data East actually spells it out for you, which is nice. <clears throat> All right. So now let's uh, get back into some of the gameplay aspects of this game. All right, so let me run you through the play field a little bit here. So uh, when you start the ball, you're gonna launch, it launches up the ramp here. And then the skill shot is to just hit it back up the ramp. So we got 100,000 points for that and that will progress up. A ball two might be 200,000, ball three might be 300,000, sometimes it'll, uh, it'll give extra ball as a skill shot, and sometimes it'll do double score, like on ball three. So the main strategy of the game is to get the million point shot. Uh, a lot of Data East games from this vintage will have a million point shot, and that is pretty much the main way to get the points in the game, is to like the million point shot. So on this game, it's the ramp to spell DeLorean. Every time you get a ramp, you'll get a letter. And then after you spell DeLorean, it'll light the ramp for 1 million points on a timer. And you just want to hit that as many times as you can. So we'll get up to uh, DeLorean here. We're up to E, A, gives you a little warning. Next shot, we'll light this ramp for a million points. And you have uh, 12 seconds, it looks like. One million, one million, one million gigawatts. So that's the main strategy is hit the ramp all day if you're accurate enough to do that. Uh, I am not. All right, so multi-ball in this game is actually quite hard to get. Uh, to qualify your locks, you got to get these three drop targets down and then hit the vertical up kicker, which is right here, and that will lock your first ball. Now you need to hit the DMC targets down again and then again to lock your third ball. Now you can do it all in one series. You don't have to do drop targets to lock a ball. Uh, you could do the drop targets, drop targets, drop targets, and then uh, lock your three balls. There's ball two locked. And now, all right, so ball three is ready. Multi-ball will start the next time we hit the vertical up kicker. Now we're in multi-ball, they're going to shoot out. All right, we're in multi-ball, the uh, DMC targets are blinking. Uh, knocking all three targets down will light the jackpot. So you see the jackpots are flashing up here. Go for the jackpot. Jackpot is hit the ramp. Basically, everything's hit the ramp in this game. 
<clears throat> but we got our jackpot. That was the 2015 jackpot. So it's still flashing jackpot, so it should be uh, ready for another jackpot. It is, it's the 1885 jackpot, different music. And it's still blinking jackpots, so I guess you can just keep getting jackpots. Yeah, they're going up progressively as we get them. So uh, it's the 1885 jackpot on the left ramp and uh, the 2015 jackpot on the right ramp. All right, so let's drain this out. All right, so the next uh, skill shot's 200,000 points. We're on ball two now. Whoa. Got the skill shot. All right, so the other uh, shot, uh, well, next to the drop targets is the spinner, which feeds the pop bumpers, if I can actually get in there. Still can't get in there. That feeds the pop bumpers. And then next to that is the clock tower shot. Uh, it's basically a, a mystery hole. So you have a bonus multiplier, 5X, light extra ball, 100,000 points, 50,000 plus bonus hold. White DeLorean Millions, Turbo Bumpers, 50,000 points. So every time you hit that, you'll get whatever's blinking. And if you keep hitting it, you'll just keep getting whatever's lit. So we got uh, three more shots to that. And once you get all these mystery awards, it gives you a really cool light show. We are one away. There, century bonus it's called. Kind of neat. Let's drain out. All right, ball three, skill shot, three mil, uh, 300,000. We'll get that while we're here. All right, so there's three stand-up targets right here. Uh, that is your uh, bonus multiplier. That'll increase every time that you complete those. And then over here, you have the McFly targets. Uh, it spots you a couple to begin with. And these, you have to hit the blinking one to qualify the next one. And then, so you have to hit them in, in the correct order. And then that lights the uh, casino, spin, casino spins clock value <clears throat> at this casino. And that's pretty much it to the game. Um, you can light the out lanes for specials. Uh, but really it's uh, hit the ramp all day which is why this game doesn't get a lot of respect. The other thing that I don't like about the game, the main thing that I don't like about the game, there's a lot of posts. There's no stand-up targets to hit, they're all posts. So it just feels like you can, you know, if you're not accurate with your shots like I am, it just feels like you're hitting posts like all the time. So it kind of, it's got that brick fest feel to it. But overall, it's a pretty fun game. Uh, you know, artwork's good, sounds good, music's good. So let me set up some cameras and I will play a game and see if I can uh, get a decent game going. All right, let's try a game here and I'll see if I can show you some stuff. I'm not that great of a player, but I'll try my best.
So that wasn't too bad for me. <coughs> Anytime I can uh, at least get the millions uh, ramp lit, and I actually got two million point shots on that one. Uh, <coughs> I didn't even bother going for multi ball. I'm, I'm terrible at this vertical up kicker shot. Uh, but. But well, we'll go with that. I uh, showed some off, off some of the game. Uh, so if you never played this game and you happen to see one somewhere, uh, definitely check it out. It's definitely a fun game. Uh, but you saw uh, uh, part of that game. I mean, I was just I couldn't hit anything. I was just bricking posts the whole time. That's when this game's not fun. When you're not hitting anything but posts, it's it's nothing but frustrating. But uh, you know, it's it's a cool game. It's a great theme. Uh, I love the artwork. I love the music. And the sounds, the call outs, um, you know, just the gameplay is, you know, it's Data East, uh, not as creative uh, gameplay wise as what Williams was doing at this point, but, uh, you know, it is quite a fun game. All right, so let's uh, go to the workshop and wrap up this video. All right, so that'll conclude our little video on my Back to the Future pinball machine, did a little overview, went over the shots and rules, did a gameplay video. And we also soldered on that lithium 2032 battery onto the circuit board to get some tech into this video. Hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I did, within the last couple days, uh, looks like I do have an original Data East power supply coming. It's an untested, probably not working power supply coming to replace the Rotten Dog power supply that's been in my game for the last 12 years. Uh, so in a future video, we will completely rebuild that power supply with all new parts and get that into the Back to the Future pinball machine. Uh, didn't get a lot done this week. I was sick for a couple days, and then we had that heat wave. So I'm running a little bit behind on the uh, roller games. But hopefully uh, within the next week or two, I will have the roller games restoration update part number eight up. Uh, 
working on the play field and starting to restore stuff on that. Uh, so that'll do it. I want to thank you for watching my vintage pinball. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Please hit that subscribe button if you're not a subscriber to my channel. I've got many more videos coming in the future. Uh, check me out on Facebook. It's My Vintage Pinball starring Pin Dude on Facebook. Uh, that'll do it. I'm Pin Dude. Thanks for watching My Vintage Pinball. I'll see you later.